It's Chelsea. It's Nina. And, and you're, you're in the, the Critics' Kingdom. Kingdom. So today, we are going to get into Windy Woo, Homecoming Warrior. Uh, this is one that I didn't... I think that I, w- I stopped watching this sort of... Or I, st- I stopped watching Disney Channel as this was coming out. Uh, I don't remember it very well, but I always liked Brenda's song. Yeah, I mean, she's like an OG of Disney. Yeah, for real, for real. Um, but I feel like even liking Brendan's song didn't make me want to watch this, so mm-hmm. I think that I was I was older and therefore no longer interested in the Disney Channel suite situation. Yeah, it came out in um, 2006, so it was kind of, what was that like... Middle schoolish. For me, that was end. Well, it came. I would assume that it came out November, two thousand six. That was top. That was the beginning of the last year of middle school. For yeah, me. so eighth, eighth grade. grade. Beginning of eighth grade. Eighth so grade. I definitely probably was not watching. I love how you say this like we're not in the same grade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do it. I do it all the time. You do it. I was like, we we were we're in the same year. We we're only were. a month apart. <laughs> We're in the exact same. Well, I guess I, I guess I do it. I guess I do it for our audience. I do it because you know we know how old we are. They all know how old we are. So it's like, yeah, for me, I was moving past this phase of my life. Yeah, this was like thirteen. So let me ask you rephrase. Thirteen, I was past that phase. Of my yeah. Life. So I think I was aware that it existed, but I was like, I'm not watching decoms anymore. Like this is after High School Musical. Yeah, I was I really yeah, deeply yeah. uninterested in anything on the Disney Channel by then. Yeah, no, I I remember I watched this and I liked it, but mm-hmm. I didn't remember all that much about it. Um, I don't think I was like heavily watching Disney Channel, but like I would sometimes watch the original movies. I thought they were interesting, and I liked Brenda's song. Yeah, so. she was yeah Brenda's song because she's just great. She was great again. I think it was. I think it has something to do with that like representation on the screen. Yeah, anybody who isn't like I identified with white female characters who obviously, like, I, I obviously did that. But, right. But it was just, like, anytime there was anyone on the screen who also happened to not be white, it was like, oh, that's a, an added bonus. That's right. nice. <laughs> it's pleasant. Uh, but, okay, to sort of just get into the recap of this one, um, so this is really me watching it for the first time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we begin the film in... At a, at a temple in Mongolia, here's the thing. The rest of the film, the whole rest of the film, we don't return to Mongolia at all as a concept. At least not that I caught. If, mm-hmm. we, if, we, if it happens, it's very slight. So I don't understand why this particular temple, why, this, the, why the monks of this legend are stationed at a temple in Mongolia when everything else about this film is... Chinese, like they're supposed to be a Chinese family, and the legend is Chinese, so yes. I just don't. I'm putting that out there. If anyone has an answer, please let me know. Or if, <laughs> because Mongolia is a separate country, just so, in case anybody also, also doesn't like, know the that. The Mongols have a, you know what I mean? Like it's a they have a complicated relationship with, with the Chinese, China. and yeah. it's not even like they make the villain in this Mongol. You know what I mean? Like it's just it's not addressed. That's my issue. Is that it seems that it's just not addressed. Or alluded to that, you know, there's a layered thinking here. So I feel like it was a mistake. Um, but I don't know. I don't know 100% either way. So if anyone, has, purpose, yeah, if anyone has thoughts, please feel free to share. But that's where we begin. We zoom in. And at this monk's temple, uh, this particular monk whose name we will learn is Shen. Uh, he is, we watch him sort of, I guess, finish his training. And... Then he goes up to older monks, and they're essentially like, you know, it's time. They're also speaking English at the Mongolian temple. <laughs> I, like I said, I don't know. I think that this whole, sh- this whole situation, it was an afterthought. Anyway, the point is, they're like, it's time. And they show him, they pull out this uh, parchment image of a girl that looks very much like Brenda Song, but, you know, in ancient Chinese garb. Um... And they essentially say, oh, you know, it's time for the reincarnated one to, for you to go and get her. And he's, you know, he's like, where is she? They tell him that he, she's in the West, in Fairbanks, California, and it's time for him to go get her. And he's like, okay, great, I won't let you down. They express worry that he is not the one who will 
let them down. And as they say that, we sort of, we get an image of a girl, you know, just drawing at her desk. We pull out eventually to see, you know, being called Wendy, Wendy, we pull out to see she's in class, not paying attention. It's Brenda Song, Wendy Wu, our main character, who is drawing an image of her, like, becoming homecoming queen. Because as we quickly learn, that is all she is currently concerned with, uh, is her coronation. Yes. As the, as the, you know, true royal of her Of her high school. school. Yeah. What may have you. Um... but we quickly learn that there's an issue with this because while she thought that she was essentially the only candidate and sort of running unopposed, she now sees that Jessica Dawson is handing out cookies in the cafeteria saying, you know, vote for me for homecoming queen. Uh, and she's appalled by this, especially by the fact that her brother takes a cookie because she sees that as a deep betrayal <laughs> of sibling loyalty. Uh, so... She's deeply concerned with this now, and she's like, oh my god, like, I have to do something to get back on top. She's like, I'm gonna go home and, you know, bake 500 cupcakes and hang them out of school. Well, I think first she has to And force mom. my father <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to bake to, it all with yeah, me. Yeah, like, oh yeah, one of her parents just make her 500 cupcakes. Like, that's, <laughs> like, that's okay. But that's setting up the type of character this is, and, you know, maybe a little self-serving, maybe a little selfish... Maybe has had many things handed to her and hasn't had to work for many things in her life. So doesn't understand the cost of things. It's all being, you know, set up. Right. Uh, When she gets home, though, that same monk who we watched in the beginning, he's been taking a study trip towards California, and he has arrived at her door, and they have a not-so-great first meeting. Uh, She doesn't really want anything to do with him. She's kind of just like, you're crazy, but... When he tries to come in, they she ends up like utilizing a sudden instinct that she clearly does not know that she's ever had, and they end up having a little you know a little bit of a scuffle with and she uses martial arts with a broom and she's obviously kind of freaked out by that doesn't know where it came from, but you know we move on from that and go and see that her mother is a you know, she works for a museum in some mm-hmm. capacity. Not the curator, but somewhere in that world of, you know, programming. And her boss, who might be the curator, uh, essentially has sort of dumped this ancient Chinese exhibit in her lap. And she's struggling because she has all these artifacts now that she has to, like, catalog and sort of write placement cards for, you know, create... His- not create histories for, but iterate histories for... And she doesn't have any of that knowledge. She just doesn't... She's, she doesn't have, like, a connection to her culture in that way because she is a first-generation immigrant. Or, no, sorry. She is a first-generation American, the child of... Her mother is a Chinese immigrant. Um, and so she's just struggling. That's the point. <laughs> she's struggling with this, and that is also being set up in this, that, you know... We have to learn the background of this story. So, essentially, a little bit later, we see that with all of these artifacts, um, among them is a an, a very old box. We have another Pandora's box situation. Disney seems to like this trope. <laughs> the security guard at the museum, like, he hears something weird happening in there. He goes to get it. it he opens it, and... You know, it glows green and something goes, a spirit goes in and sort of possesses him. Her brother shows up at the museum and the spirit transfers over to her brother Peter. And so when he comes home, Wendy's asleep on the couch and he goes to harm her. But then Shen shows up and is like, no, I've been watching her, I've been protecting her. You will not, your spirit will not mess with her. And he and Peter do like a long form, like true martial arts fight. (laughs) And in with, silence. With no, in, in silence, like no dialogue, with barely any music, like it's all pretty much just, you know, the crashing of things and all that stuff. It's great. Uh, it was very, very enjoy- enjoyable. And essentially the next morning, uh, the, like the monk keeps trying to protect her. She's not having it. Her grandmother runs into the monk, like he meets him, and she's like, oh, are you... Like, is she the warrior? Is Wendy the warrior? Are you here to protect her, to help her? And he's just like, yes. 
So the grandmother's now in on it and is going to try to help him and help Wendy sort of complete this mission. We're not 100% sure why yet, but we also learn from her mother who's researching various artifacts. She's researching this box, and she learns about the story about Yon Lo, who was, you know, a big bad. Big bad dude, hates the world, wants to destroy the world, wants to rule the world, all of that. And in order to combat him, the, like, ancient monks trained a female warrior to protect her village. And she ended up defeating Yan Lo, but ended up trapped essentially in a cycle of reincarnation so that every 90 years they, like, Yan Yo's spirit comes back to life, I guess, yeah. is the word. And her descendant, her descendants have sort of pledged to take up the mantle of every nine years, like, getting all of her training back and fighting Yan Lo. And that Shen, the monk, is also in this reincarnated cycle because Shen was her, like, partner. Mm-hmm. And they're supposed to defeat Yan Lo together. Or she's supposed to defeat Yan Lo with his assistance. That's the basic idea. So, Grandma, in order to get the monk to, like, stay close, essentially lies to Wendy's parents. is like, ah, he's my distant cousin from China. He wrote and said that he was coming. I forgot to tell y'all. He's gonna stay here now. There's like, okay, fine, cool. <laughs> and he decides to sort of follow her around. Like, he's trying to, he's like, you need to train. And she's just like, not having it. She's like, absolutely not. And then he's like, this spirit's coming after you. You gotta wear this amulet. And she's like, that, that joint is hideous. Absolutely not. <laughs> and then he's like, all right, fine. If you're not gonna do anything, I'm gonna just follow you around. And I'm gonna make sure that you, the spirits stay warded off. Uh, she hates this. But eventually, what she ends up finding out is that because he, well, she also feels like he's ruining her chances of being homecoming queen just by existing at her school because he's, you know, foreign and is not trying to blend in in any way, shape, or form. And she realizes, though, that she is failing history, which we got a glimpse of in the first, you know, scenes of the film. And that in order to even be eligible now to be homecoming queen, because she has to have a decent GPA she has to get an A on her, like, Chinese history test. And, but lo and behold, she has a monk here with all of the knowledge of thousands of years of reincarnations inside of him, so she makes him a deal, essentially. I'll begin training if you uh, help me with Chinese history. And he also agrees to help her mom mm-hmm. because she needs all that info for the other facts. So, all right, like, all is well. Uh... And she sort of is like, if I'm going to be, if you're going to be around like this, you got to do better. So she takes him on this great shopping montage because we love a shopping montage. By the end of it, he looks like a like K-pop Mando Pop star with his full Farrah Fawcett do. Mm-hmm. Um, and they go to like this party to sort of, again, promote the homecoming situation. And, you know, suddenly she has the... Of color vote, it seems, because they're like, oh, Shen is cool. Like, we think Shen is dope. And she ends up, but she also ends up realizing that sort of in this time period, that possess- that spirit has been sort of jumping from person to person, trying to track her, trying to essentially, you know, destroy her before the big showdown is scheduled to happen so that it can take its full form and destroy the earth, all that good stuff. Right. Uh, and it now has gotten to the point where at this party it's possessed one of her best friends and they end up, you know, she ends up being attacked by the pool. And this is not, this is what sort of really spurs her of like, oh wait, I really do gotta train. So then, in addition to like meditation practices that they've been doing, Shen says that he's gonna train her in the art of the monks, which involves sort of uh, four main tenants? Four main tenants. So the snake, the, you know, training in the ways of the snake for flexibility, ways of the tiger for aggression, the leopard for speed, the crane for balance. And he uh, animates, like, ancient statues of monks to train her, but she's like, oh, this is weird. Like, it's not working for her, so he gets those, like, animated statues of monks to, like, go with, like, possess her teachers. And then her teachers are training her in various ways, which there are also thoughts on that. Um, But... 
yeah, it's essentially seems like it's all sort of going well, and she's, like, getting it, she's getting better, and her and Shen are developing a real friendship, a real, you know, maybe more than a friendship, definitely on Wendy's part, some things are developing there, and she's sort of losing, she's, she still wants to be homecoming queen, but she's not as concerned with that anymore, she's sort of developing skills and considerations outside of, you know, what some might call vapid interests. But then she finds out that the big battle is fated for the exact same night as Homecoming. And she's very upset by that, because she's just like, Shen, what the hell? Um, you knew this, and you knew how important Homecoming was to me, and you didn't tell me. And her grandmother is trying to tell her, you know, my mother was the warrior. Like, this is a big responsibility. It's bigger than just you, like... You know, no one's gonna make you choose, but I hope you choose, like, make you choose one way or the other, but I hope you choose well. Da, da, da. She chooses Homecoming. And she goes to Homecoming, and Shen, because he has an obligation, is like, I'm gonna go fight the Big Bad. The Big Bad has now possessed Jessica Dawson, of all people, and has gone to the museum, has animated terracotta army soldiers, and Shen is fighting those soldiers on his own. Uh, the monk spirits come to tell Wendy at the dance that that is what's happening. And she has a moment where, like, essentially her love for Shen is what propels her to say, oh no, like, why is he fighting alone? I have to go help him. She leaves the dance, she goes, she's fighting the big da big bad. Grandma shows up with, like, the ancient Chinese warrior, like, outfit. <laughs> so when yeah. he gets to, like, change mid-fight... From her, like, magenta orange dress into this really, like, badass ancient Chinese... I don't know exactly what, like... It's not yeah, I don't know, I don't know the name of but what, what she wears. The garb. Yeah. You know, it's, like, not a costume at all, but, like, you know, the appropriate word. There's a name for it. Yeah, I, I don't know what <laughs> and, it is. And she... Yeah, she's a badass. She fights, and, you know, and it seems like they won. The possession comes out of Jessica. But... They think that they defeat Yan Lo. They haven't really defeated Yan Lo. Yan Lo shows up in his true badass form, which is like this big ass dragon. Mm -hmm. And essentially, Shen ends up sacrificing himself. And even part of the reason Wendy didn't want to do this was because she knew, like, Shen knew that he would end up sacrificing himself. And she's like, that's not, that doesn't seem right for you to die every 90 years from me. That seems a little messed up, but it sort of is about to happen again. And. That, like, really, really spurs Wendy to sort of look inside of herself, to meditate on all of the like, knowledge of her past lives, to use that, plus the genuine love she's developed for Shen, to, like, access all of her, like, extra, extra special warrior powers. She bangs it out, beats the shit out of Yan Lo, and, um, wins. Yeah. And, but by loving Shen the way she has, she has now also not only defeated Yan Lo in this life, but she has managed to break the cycle and has sort of released all of her future descendants from having to defeat Yan Lo because he is finally gone for good. And that is Wendy Wu, Homecoming Warrior. Oh, and she wins Homecoming Queen. <laughs> oh, yeah, and she wins Homecoming Queen. That yeah. is also, you can see where my attention was from. <laughs> <laughs> she does also win Homecoming Queen. Yes. And I she leaves home, She leaves Homecoming, Homecoming Queen as Homecoming Queen to go in protection right yeah she's like i don't care about this as much as i care about shed now so right i'm gonna go do that uh i will like to get into the review i will just say first time watching it like i said damn this shit was good like it was good it no it really is like i think we have so many things to talk about because it's just like chock full of just a variety of, like, not even tropes, but just, like, a lot of things that are just interesting. Um, I mean, even the fact that this is, like, one of the few female-centered martial arts films, like, mm -hmm. that I've seen, like, me, that I'll say, like, U.S. mainstream, because obviously I'm not as familiar with what's out necessarily in, like, in China itself, or, like, Japan, or... With Asia is a in wider... East Asia as, like, a whole. Yeah. I'm sure there are female-centered martial arts films there, but... I'd hope. I'd yeah, hope. I would hope so. Um, but I think this was, like, especially, like, for children's programming, like, mm -hmm. that's just a really, just a really cool thing to see, and I think you even brought up, like, even the fact that the Karate Kid, we had to wait till the 
uh, the, third, the third one, the third one when we got girl. Hillary Swain. And it was, and, and she was white. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> the third one, and she was white. So you're like, yeah, oh, well. this well, is Well, I like, mean, all the karate kids are white, but still. Right. Well, except for Jaden. Except for Jaden. You but, know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I think you even, just even that, like, the fact that it's, like, a female-centered, Asian-American female-centered, like, martial arts film has already just made it, like, a unicorn of sorts, and, yeah. like, a cool unicorn. Um, and I think we also came up with a lot of, um... Just a lot of, like, things that were kind of... We didn't know whether they bordered on, like, exploitation versus homage was kind yeah. of, like, an interesting thing to parse through this film because even with all of the martial arts film... Or scenes and, like, the fact that she had to go through this as an... Like, it's like that you would pick this way, I guess, of framing, like, an Asian-American story. Yeah. And that it, some, and it has to involve martial arts was just, like... Hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like, there's, a, again, it comes back to that level of, you know, that representing it and seeing it, and there are people who argue, you know, that whole bit of any representation is good representation right. sort of situation, but it is also, you know, this is one of those ones where it's like, I actually, I like how it exists, but I kind of want, I want something else too, Yeah. you know, to like yeah. balance that to show other types of stories uh, involving people with these backgrounds, but, yeah, I'm not, like, a connoisseur of the kung fu film suite. I know. I I've seen a... Should have asked my dad. He's obsessed. <laughs> which, which is interesting, because I know that it is a... It's weirdly, like, a big deal in black... black commu- in black male communities, especially people f- growing up between, like, let's say, like, the 70s yeah. and, like, 95. Yeah. Like, people in that... I mean, little... even the Wu-Tang Clan... <laughs> Let's let the, like uh, before I even say anything else. Wu Tang Clan Chappelle literally does that in like the racial draft episode. Like, yes. He's like of the Chappelle show where the Wu Tang Clan is like I'm gonna be or the Asians claim Wu Tang. Yes, and everyone's shocked, <laughs> and they're like, "Yeah, man, <laughs> that's we've been wanting that for." But it's like we have so many. It's like there's just a very interesting relationship between the black community and the Asian community um, that I think. Sometimes was, fraught, sometimes yes, sometimes fraught. Harmonious. But then, especially in the entertainment and media way, like it's ve- it is a much more of a melding of world of creative worlds. Right. It's it's always very interesting because even I mean people argue it all the time, and it's true that like K pop is basically like hit hip hop and R and B from the early two thousands. Like it's like they took the exact like tropes, the clothes, the singing styles, transported it to like 2018, 2019, 2020. So it's like there's just this very w- interesting like relationship that exists. But and, um, and then on the back end, it is a thing of you know like black people really like kung fu films, right? And <laughs> like, then yeah, and then black really people in, really like kung, kung fu. Yeah, and yeah, and like really, and you see that you actually see elements of that in early hip hop. But so, so in a way, like there's a way in which like kung fu and like martial arts like have it influence in hip hop too. So it's this weird. It's just we're just sort of cyclic thing that is yeah. happening it's a symbiotic relationship creatively i think yeah but i think that that also makes it hard for us to sort of judge to judge to us to fully judge like moments that we find problematic how much of that is us with our lens our experience as right. like black women things that we might say like oh like this is a nice or i enjoy that scene it's a nice homage like again lens as black women with our sets of experiences versus what what someone with coming from an East Asian de- East Asian descent from Mandarin descent like how they're engaging with those exact same scenes right yeah because it's like we view it or one of the ways we could view it would be like through the lens of like black exploitation and how that was yes it was um, representation but it's like <laughs> Is that the ideal type of representation? No. no but at the same time... But people birthed, did enjoy it. And it birthed a lot... Of what we have now. Exactly, so... And it's like, you wouldn't have been able to get there without that. So it's it, it's a very interesting, you know, thing in this film of being like, is this really an homage, or is this an exploitation type of thing, or is this the only way that we feel an Asian American story could be told... At that in time. In 2006. Because yeah. that might have also been it. Because, I mean, I'm sure as most people know there really wasn't any Asian-American representation on TV for a long time. And even on Disney Channel, Brenda Song is very much... She is she is a unicorn on Disney Channel. Oh, yeah. She is the only... Just off the top of my... She is the only 
immediately, and, and I will add, like, immediately recognizably yeah. East Asian sort of Disney Channel star that I recall from... From that, from from that, that era. era. From yeah. when I was growing up. That's the only... I don't think... I can't... I can't think of anybody I else. I can't think of anyone else. It was really obviously just if there's her. somebody mixed and we don't know then yeah that's what you know ob- obviously there may have been others percent. but she's um, the only one that I could think of immediately and and it is extra interesting because up until this film none of the characters that she played on Disney Channel were particularly ch- tied to being Asian yeah or. East Asian cultures as we have received them in the West. Yeah. You know? London Tipton is not... She's just an heiress. Yeah, because I want to say even with London Tipton, I think that Brenda has said this, it wasn't written as, as a yeah, POC that's how character. It feels. Yeah, most of her roles feel like they weren't necessary. She was just... They just liked her. Right. And she happened to be East Asian, but she played... It's a colorblind roles, essentially. Yeah. Um, colorblind or, like, ethnically blind. She basically did what I think people always idealize now. That people say that they always try and do now. She was basically doing that. Yeah, so, (laughs) but it is interesting then that the, when she gets her own Disney Disney Channel original movie, Mm -hmm. and, you know, the first time that she is the main character, you know, the main character is being built around the actress Brenda Song. That this is the direction that they choose to go. Right. And they, so that, again, is, like, begging those questions of, like, and I don't have the answers for it. They're just considerations that I had while watching the film. Yeah, it's just one of those things to think Yeah, about. you know, what, to what level are they exploit, like, is it a genuine attempt to create representation mm-hmm. for children that they realize that they weren't representing on the channel? Mm-hmm. Is it them... You know, just, all right, well, she's the main character. It has to be something of East Asian descent, right. which leans more in the direction of exploitation. Right. Is it a little bit of both? Probably a little bit of both. Right. Probably wrapped up in the whole thing. But then even that, you know, as I, correct me if I'm wrong, but Brenda Song's not even Mandarin. She's, so I, or is she, or she's, she's half, half Mandarin? She's half Thai, half Hmong. Okay. So she's, I, I actually, I didn't, I think they have their own language. I don't even know if they speak. Mandarin or Cantonese, I'll have to look that up. Okay. But um, she's but the Hmong people are a specific ethnic group in so is that why specifically it's in from Mongolia? China and Laos. Yeah. Well, um, is it that why it's <laughs> in Mongolia? I don't know. <laughs> because they really just don't return to it. They don't. But I don't. I just don't know why the mon like why would the monastery be in Mongolia? Yeah. And they never bring it up. See what I mean? It's these sorts of things where it's just like... I think this is always the problem when you do... <laughs> or not the problem, but this is always, I think, the the like the glitchy part of yeah. these types of things where it's like when you get into these, like, the nitty-gritty stuff that it's like, it seems so small, but it, it's like, it matters. Like, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, you're saying that we're starting off in Mongolia, but we never return to Mongolia again, and then everything is just based about China. So then it's like, but those are two different countries with two different histories. And they and, and that is not to say, because also, like, to let's be real about this, generally speaking, but especially, you know, like, borders are artificial. And right. borders are, borders change. They're mutable. Yeah. Yeah, like, and know, they have changed. They probably they have changed, changed since this came out. But and, like, <laughs> and, like, there are relations, and even China, like, to be Chinese is not, like, there are multiple ethnic ethnicities. Groups. There are just multiple, um... There are multiple peoples within certain borders. So, like, I do know that there are, there, there are histories, you know, with, Mo- like, in Mongolia and China as countries, as, you know, nations. But, again, they just don't address it. So I don't know what lens from which we're coming it's to just, yeah, and it, yeah. this particular... It, it's just weird because it's like... Images. It just doesn't make any sense. And, and like, it, when you start actually thinking about it, um, because it's just, like, you or wouldn't... I don't, I don't it's know like you what, wouldn't I don't start know something sense out means. here and then be like, but we're telling you... You wouldn't start something out in New York and then say, we're telling a Canadian story. You know? Like, it's, like... Because it, it's, like, wait, what? <laughs> and it might be something where it's, like, you're actually telling a story on the border of Canada and New York. Like, so if you're on like, Niagara Falls but, or something. Yeah, but it's, like... Well, but you're but on you the Canadian didn't. side. <laughs> that you're on the Canadian side you just didn't show you didn't tell us that right. you're not giving us enough context to understand why it's being placed in certain locations right um 
and I don't and what and what bugs me on that is where it gets glitchy is that like I don't think that that's purposeful. I don't think it's something where you're you're just acknowledging something for only for people who are in the know with mm-hmm. you know in that ethnicity and that culture. I don't think that that's what you're doing. I think that you are just either like I think that there's a level of laziness to it where you're just either not giving us the information because there isn't enough time and you think it can be cut out and it doesn't yeah. matter. Or you didn't do the research and you just like kind of know that this is a thing and you're like, let me put it here and they'll do they'll figure it out amongst themselves. Right. And that way we can. Or just they say, won't bother to look into it, which is probably. And we yeah. can just <laughs> and we can just say that we did it. Right. We can say that we tried. You know what I mean? So that's where that's where I bump on it because I can't sit here and say that I know like I don't know that it doesn't make sense that they started in Mongolia. I actually don't know that, but. From what I can tell, like, in my attempt to research, I can't find answers that make any, that do make full sense, or that suggests that it's something I, you know, just need to look further into, and it's not simply a mistake of some kind. So that's annoying. Yeah. And again, gets into that whole, like, exploitation aspect of it, for the simple fact of, like, that is part of exploitation, is, like, choosing to tell a story and not giving it its due justice. It's, like, the opposite of what happened with God Kick It Up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think Gotta Kick It Up is also a better version of, like, but we're going to tell story, a story. So it's, this is all made up, you know? Yeah. No, and it's like, I get it, but I think Gotta Kick It Up is a better example of, like, we're going to tell a Latinx story, but it's not going to be tropey. Or, like, stere- uh, like as stereotypical. Yeah, but that, again, that might also be just because it's real life, you know? Right, like, it's it's very possible, but I don't know why they wouldn't mean. have done this like the same. Like I don't know. I just I, I feel like it, not saying I have an issue with the plot. I think it's like a fun movie and everything. But again, it's like I do wonder why you would frame the only like the that, by that point the only Asian American Disney Channel original movie like, all uh, yeah. around. Uh, you know something that like reincarnation <laughs> and like a mystical and, a mystical myth- being and martial arts and, and like all, the pe- like, all like, these they have her meditate going om and you're like that doesn't even <laughs> she's literally going om and you're, it's cringeworthy that moment in right and it's just like why are we because again it's like it's not that these things don't exist but like, like why is this why is the way this, we're choosing to tell the story exactly. So, I think you get into a larger question about that. And then just also even with, like, the Asians, and I feel like this is a general thing that a lot of people do, but any POC are always the mystical beings yeah. in the story. Oh. I feel like that especially happens to a lot of Asians. The, the magical B-I-P-O-C. Yes, literally. <laughs> literally the magical B-I-P-O-C. Just, you know, yeah. Just, <laughs> it's everywhere. It's like, she's That's able it. to kick real high and flip in the air. Not she's able to kick it <laughs> That's what she does, <laughs> but that's like that's like the the feeling that you get. It's like okay, but like why does she have to be like? Why is the only way that we can like not consume? That sounds intense. But why is the only way that we can like view this is with her as like this like exceptional <laughs> yeah. being rather than her just being like I just care about homecoming. Like <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Like I said, I I do really I do really bump on the fact that. And, I, and again, it comes into, I do, I just wonder in my head, you know, how much of this was, how much of this is, you know, execs in a room mm-hmm. demanding certain things and being like, we have the money, so you're going to do it. How much of this is, like, general ignorance? How much of this is maybe an actress being like, if I'm going to do a Disney. I want to do martial I w- arts. I would yeah. like to do this type of story. Right. You know? Um, so, it's just, there are always questions of, I think it's always, it's. Always questions of agencies. Yeah. Of agency in these particular instances. How much agency is afforded to the people that the story is about. Right. Um, and how the story is told. Yeah. Uh, but I think you also, uh, this one was interesting because you have like the idea of like the multi-generational household, which is very common in a lot of mm-hmm. um, POC families, um, where it's like the grandmother lives with you. Mm-hmm. Along with the mom, dad, and you know the brother and sister, yeah, or, and or the aunts, aunts and, and uncles, the cousins. Yeah, like it's like cousins this... can just pop up from a distant <laughs> land, and, and then you, everybody's just like, like okay. oh, yeah, actually, that's that tracks. That's that, that, that makes sense. <laughs> that's, that might happen. And then I think it's also interesting because then this film gets into the idea of like assimilating, 
and like what that means to assimilate into the culture that the new culture that you're part of. Or I think I don't I don't know if I would say it just like that. I would because I you know I am a first generation American born of immigrants. I would the way that I would say it is sort of less so like assimilating because what's happening what we see happen here is essentially we get this idea that her parents her parents were both first generation immigrants. Maybe one of them was, you know, second generation um American, but like they are both descended from immigrants to America. Mm-hmm. And her parents are American. Mm-hmm. For all intents and purposes, you know? And they don't so they don't necessarily have a strong connection to. They've never really considered, they've never really engaged with a connection to their Chinese ancestry Mm -hmm. and their Chinese lineage. Um, So I think it's like, it's sort of less assimilation and I think it's more a sense of what what do you keep and what do you put down? Mm -hmm. You know? um, I grew up in a house where we ate certain things for breakfast. So when I think about it, it's like, alright, when my kids are growing up, what are they going to eat for breakfast? Are they going to eat you know, and we ate both, but am I gonna make sure that I know how to cook ackee and saltfish so that my kids can eat ackee and saltfish for breakfast? Or, you know, and I see it with other members of my family where it's like, yeah, they didn't really respond that much. They preferred pancakes. So they didn't learn to cook ackee and saltfish. So their kids never ate ackee and saltfish from their house. Like that, they didn't grow up with that. Mm-hmm. Their, their kids know that as Jamaican food, but don't know that the, their kids don't see that as part of them, mm-hmm. as, as part of who they are. That's not part of their culture. So I think it's, it's less of an assimilation thing, and it, more, it is more of a sort of identity building. How do I define myself? And how do I, I f- define myself within multiple cultures? Do I even define myself within multiple cultures? The answer to which it seems for her parents was no, that they did not. Um, how much of that was choice, how much of that was circumstance is right. unclear, but that is what ended up happening. So but by the time Wendy's born, you know, Wendy's an American child. Right. She is of Chinese ancestry, but she is a fully American child, and she doesn't have the connection that we only see sort of coming through her grandmother, who was right. an immigrant to this country. And seemingly, I guess, would you would then say chose to assimilate in some ways, but definitely not all. Like, definitely had a complicated assimilation into mm-hmm. American dealings. Yeah. Um, and then I think, like, because even her, we end up coming back around to it because this whole movie is cyclical. Um, <laughs> it's, and it's literally a... <laughs> this whole movie is like a circle. Um, but her father, like, <sighs> says, like, at one point um, when he's talking to her mother at the table, he's like, the most Chinese we got in my family was saying, it's Wayne Chung tonight. <laughs> And, and, but they didn't really like do anything more than that. But even though like I will he does say later. in this one, they do they the food is still there because I remember even when they're sitting down waiting for um when they meet Shin, they're eating like what looked to be like they had like rice, they had chops, like it was like the food well, was still there, and they well, recognized moon cakes. Did, no, well, I don't know if it was full there because don't they specifically say doesn't Shen like Shen like makes them food. And then, but they she, were and then the gra- and the grand they were eating it like it's the same way that you would eat like if someone from France came and made me French food I'd eat the French food but that doesn't mean that it's a part of my like I recognize it as a part of my culture it's what I cook it's what I make. it's something that I know how to just do mm-hmm. in the way you know what I mean like you'll recognize it and you'll be like okay like I can eat it I know that it is you know like maybe I and that's what he said he's like I remember these growing up. But, like, they haven't engaged with that beyond that. It is, right. like, stuck in a memory of a different time and a different place. It's not something that they carried with them. So I don't know if the food actually did go further than well, that. Well, it but might he be does because say, the grandmother is there. And yeah. I'm assuming it's probably may or may not like, be the one cooking. Yeah, or, or, like, they know how to eat with chopsticks, but they might not be eating. You know what I mean? It might not be the most traditional food with chopsticks. Because I do know, like, I do remember him saying, he says later in the film that he... The father expresses regret for not engaging with... With his Chinese, right. With his Chinese ancestry culture, yeah. whatever you want to call it, further. 
and sort of allowing that to dissipate and, you know, just sort of going along with what was happening in the place that he was born. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, no, so I think it's, like we said, circle. Um, (laughs) So he's initially just like, we're not very Chinese at all, and then by the end it's more like, we should start getting back into yeah, that. We or we start engage. engaging with our culture a lot more. Um, so, I, you know, I think it is very... It, it's an interesting story about that. Just yeah, the, like sure. the different relationships that people have with their culture when you... The idea of, like, when you move away from somewhere, you know? What happens to the culture? Yeah. And I think that scares a lot of people, too, when they do move to a different place. Mm-hmm. And that's why you get households. And at the same time, it also scares people being different so you that's why you have households where you know you speak your mother tongue in that house right and you know you have a kid who was born in america but comes to school and he's five and he's taking esl because Mm -hmm. he it is it is a second language for them and you at the same time you also have households where you know once you come over it's immediately we're eating hamburgers and hot dogs right you're never gonna see insert ethnic food here again Mm -hmm. in your life for me it might be a jamaican patty you'll never see that again right no be fat or people don't learn aren't able to learn the language exactly or or you're not teach them the language we're not speaking that in the house ever we're watching american programming like both methodologies exist happen and then people do and then People walk tight ropes in between as well. Well, and I want to say, especially during this period, like, 06, it was not a, like... I think it's also you're seeing the children of... Like, I think about, like, I watch, like, Fresh on the Boat, and I think about the fact that, like, all right, 2006, like... Well, I mean, it's a little bit off. It's a little close, but it's, like, if... You're sort of seeing... Never mind, actually, if that's a... The, all those dates are wrong. Oh. <laughs> I just realized that. I yeah. Was well, I just. I, yeah, I was ahead. just gonna say. I feel like oh six was not a time. Like it's not like I feel like the past five years things have somewhat become a little bit more open about that. Like now people think quote unquote ethnic food is cool. So because yeah. I've I've heard from quite a lot of like um, people that are from different countries that they were just like oh well so when I used to bring this to school for lunch y'all used to make fun of me but now everybody's going out to the local like I don't know the authentic Thai restaurant and it's fine you know well that's also I think that there's a level to that that also has to do a little bit with um age as well though like age of like a demographic so in the way that you know kids are like that with everything to a certain degree, to a mm-hmm. certain degree. Like, you know, like, you do have your kids who, you know, their parents take them out all the time to various, so, like, they're like, oh, they, they're they really into this kind of food and they know about it. But generally speaking, kids tend to be wary. Of, they're either very curious about things that they don't know or very wary of them. And as you get older, you tend to grow out of that. Mm-hmm. So, like... But I do still feel like there's definitely no, been it's, something it's, the past it's, couple it's of years where it's, like... It's embraced more now, but yeah. it's still, a th- like... It is also just a thing of, like, us sort of, like, growing up and growing into that. I am trying to think in terms of years, because there's, there is also the, like, I know that I was watching on PBS, they just did, um, sort of a docuseries on, like, Asian American experiences, uh, and there was a lot of talk, you know, obviously there's a whole section that that's talking about, you know, the model minority, and how... And there's a whole part, you know, where essentially a lot of people are talking about, I guess, growing up in maybe, like, the 50s to early 70s, how mm-hmm. their parents were essentially telling them, all right, we're going to be American. You're going right. to be American, you're going to do this well, yeah. and all of that, and they'll respect you, they'll treat you better, they won't, you know, you're never going to stop being Asian to them, but we can get really close to stop being Asian to them. And I guess what I was trying to say in terms of timelines earlier is that, like, there is a world in which, and I don't think it was thought out this deeply, but, <laughs> you know, there's a world in which, okay, so if she's, you know, 15 or 16 Six, in yeah, 2006, yeah. all right, so she's born in the 90s, her parents are probably growing up in that environment, or in, or in a time period where, like, that mm-hmm. rhetoric is pretty readily available Mm -hmm. so they're they're coming to the game with that by the time that they have their own kids if that makes sense that's what the 
yeah. to the full circle thing that I mean. And then, yes, 2006, we still weren't, you know, <laughs> we it's were early just, 2000s yeah. America, like, we're still, we're still just not as open, I mean, we're not significantly more open now, but glo- the globalization of the world in terms of immediate access to other people and other cultures in, like, a very direct way mm-hmm. is still just happening. You know, and this it's fun to hear her say, like, oh, you know, like, she gets on IM with her friends. And right. she's like, oh, let's do a three-way. Those are all things that, like, are not, you know, those are things from my childhood that I don't hear my little cousin saying. Right. Now uh, like, let's so get on FaceTime. That, that interaction is just starting to happen. So it is also America's very, it's, America's never homogeneous, but Americana is still, mm-hmm. is homogeneous in a way that it's steadily growing out of now. I would say. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was just. A, it was a different time. It was a very. <laughs> it was a very different the early time. Early two thousands, man. It was a very different Long time. Different People time. were not quite as open, I think. Um, but yeah, so I think like this. This film does like handle that very interesting in an interesting way. Um, and something else that they kind of tackle is the idea of like how your lineage and your history is something that's within you. Um, versus something that not saying you don't have to learn it, you do, but but, <laughs> but it's also yeah, one of those things that is within and that can you can already be acting upon without knowing. Yeah, it's a very. I mean, I there are many ways in which like I sort of subscribe to that, uh, and it's, this one sort of touches on it in that way that she when he keeps saying to her like you know you have you have trained for this over and over and over again, you have all of that memory inside of you. You literally just have to meditate, like, you have to get your your brain to a space of calm where you can consciously access it and unlock it, as opposed to getting something from outside within, to go within. Uh, and it is a very, I encountered that concept, that principle for the first time, things like, you know, in the astrology-ish world. Yeah. You know, that like, <laughs> you know, you're coming with past lives, you're coming with knowledge or, or and even further the idea of like you're coming with blood right like the knowledge of like you come from a bloodline and <laughs> things have happened in that bloodline you know the same way that your genes have been passed on to you and it gives you and it has information that has coded you mm-hmm. like there's like the idea that there's mem- there's memory in your skin there's memory in your blood there's memory in you know all of these spaces of your body it's just a matter of opening your mind to be able to consciously access and engage with that. Right. Um, which is, you know, it is a very, that is one of those, like, very mystic, very spiritual, very new age, whatever you want to call it, ideas, but at the same time, deeply old. Uh, and, you know, I'm someone who takes everything with a lick of salt, and, you know, I'm open to everything, but I also question everything, uh, and I think that's one of those things where it's like, I would say to the general public, it, it's just, it's something to be potentially open to and to look into and see how, you know, thoughts on it. Because... See if there's any trends in your family life. <laughs> yeah, and things like that. Because, you know, like, people said that trees gave life and we, and people ignored them and then we learned photosynthesis and we were like, oh, trees give life. Trees give up life by giving oxygen. It's like, yeah, we knew that. <laughs> we didn't know the full sentence, but we knew that. We understood it on a larger platform. So, there, you know, maybe... Listen to the on Native a lar- Americans. <laughs> on, a, on a larger platform, <laughs> maybe on a larger platform, from a wider bird's-eye view, the cosmic view, like, you can have, like, things are in... Are, it's actually just the idea things are in you to unlock. Right. Not everything is coming to you externally. There are things inside of you that you just have to look into, tap Bring into... Out. And that is something in the film that I did appreciate. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that you know that this is a film about a young girl unlocking something within her that she didn't know was there. Uh, so yeah, I like that part of it. No, sure. agreed. And then also when they got into the idea of like, uh, <laughs> and I think uh, a lot of kids that are you know, especially immigrant kids would probably relate to this, but the idea of like an ancestral duty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like ancestral duty. And like and it is this weird thing of where you're like, it's an ancestral duty, but then it's coupled with this idea of and it is what happens to like the 
the kid that's in the new space is this idea of like why do I why do we have to play these same stories out? Right. You know, all of the time. Like why is it always a story like why do why do it's I It's the same couple things over and over and over yeah, and over exactly. again. Exactly. Why do I have to like even you think about it, it's literally reincarnated every ninety years. It is literally the exact same thing that happens every ninety years. Right. 90 isn't even a long enough time for it to be... You know what I mean? Like, 90 years... Like, her grandmother is still alive and remembers when her mom was... <laughs> like, her grandmother was born, like, during the Industrial Revolution. You know? Her right. Great, her great-grandmother, like, lived during the Industrial Revolution. It's not that long ago. Right. I mean, it's long, but it's not that It's long. not, like, that long. <laughs> um, so it's like, why do we have, like... Why do we have to sort of repeat these things over and over again? Uh, but... I don't know. It's... Ancestral obligation, ancestral duty is... It's, it is a deeply complicated thing because I think, and I think it gets the, it gets more complicated the older you get because when you're young, when you're little, when you're a kid, you know, children are, we know how selfish children are, you right. know, we know how selfish they are and they're supposed to be selfish. It's important that they're selfish, you know, they survive better because they're selfish, but as you get older, your world gets bigger, like, it goes beyond and beyond the scope of yourself. And, you know, if I had watched this when I was 13, I probably would have been very much in, yeah, she's right. Why should she have to, why is this her burden to bear? Right. <laughs> why does this, she didn't ask for this. She was born into it, like, and, you know, that thing, like you say, with it can, I would I can say that as an immigrant child, like, I've always been a particularly proud one. But I know, you know, I remember my sister, you know, very much, as when she was really little, sort of rejecting. She's like, I'm American. <laughs> like, I'm not, like, I'm American. Um, and just sort of, you know, rejecting these ideas of, like, why do I have to preserve the culture? Why do I have to make sure that I know how to do this? I don't want to do that. I don't mm-hmm. even like eating that type of food. Like, or, not, or I don't like that dish. Why do I have to know how to make that dish? Right. Like, and so when you're a kid, you... You move away from it, but I think the older I get, for sure, I ancestral duty is becoming more and more complicated for me. Because at the same time, while I love my individuality, while I am very American in that way, and I love my individuality, and I love my quote-unquote freedom, right? And the ability to just make choices based on what I want to do. At the same time, I am very, very aware of how many hands it took to make me and how much it matters to me what my little cousins have in their lives and what my godson has in his life and what the next generation of my family is going to bring through the world. So in that respect, it's like I have this relationship with ancestral duty where sometimes it's like I don't want to have to be I don't want to be burdened with it. And at the same time, I absolutely feel calling, you know, Mm -hmm. a calling to recognize, to reach a hand back, to touch the past and keep the past in the present as much as humanly possible. Bring the past into the future as much as humanly possible. Um, Especially as, and then especially as a black woman, because, you know, how so much especially in this country, but across the world, like, there's so much of black history and black past, black ancestral Mm -hmm. knowledge that is not, that has not been preserved. No, black women are essentially the keepers of the culture. If we're being 100% honest, like, that's literally how it goes. (laughs) Like, we're always the ones that are like, you better do this, you gotta do this, teach them this, da-da-da-da, like... Yeah, but so I, 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 I very much understand and recognize when you struggle, struggle have, has been, have, been, have been in that place, place before. It'd be really nice if I could speak like a human. Okay. <laughs> have been in that place before, but at the same time, like now I, I really get Shen and I really get her grandmother. And I, and I, like, I think it's just a tight rope. It, it really is a tight rope that everybody walks on their own. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone sort of has to decide what they're keeping and what they're putting down in their own lives. And it's, yeah, that's where I come down with that. Yeah, no, it actually reminds me of Bend It Like Beckham, which is strange, but... <laughs> I, I'm not that strange. It's but, actually where, like, 
Asian women physical activity. <laughs> Also, they both play soccer. Great prow- like Wendy fin- plays soccer. Yeah, like movie. fantastic prowess in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's not. I can understand how you got there. Yeah, it, it's just the the you part didn't see where that film. Just, yes, please, 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 please watch it. Watch it. So oh my god, I used to be obsessed. I was. Oh, uh, I was obsessed. You have with no that idea. Movie. Not a decom, but not know, a decom. Just a good one for you to watch in general. Good. That's Kira Knightley. Um, <laughs> but and and Rafe, but that's not the reason to watch it. Yeah, no, but, you know, um, but there is a part where <laughs> when Jess gets punished for playing soccer too much, her mom is like, I'm going to teach you how to make <laughs> every single um, <laughs> uh, Punjabi <laughs> dish, I think, yeah. vegetarian and, and non-vegetarian. And, she goes, <laughs> and she's like, are you kidding me? She's like, oh, she's like other girls are doing it, trying not size. You won't even learn how to make dal. <laughs> yes. Uh, or alu gobi. That's yeah. what, yeah, and that's I remember being little and being like, I remember being little and being like, I love dal. Like, you don't want to learn to make dal? What's going on? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, but it's a similar film where it's like the daughter yeah. kind of rejects certain things. But um, all that to say, it's just a similar type of, you know, ancestral duty to a degree. Um... But yeah, so I feel like this film, like, tackles that, like, really well. And then, you know, just some, like, quick things to get across. Um, A, Brenda Song is, yes. Queen deserves OG of Disney Channel. A talented actress did a wonderful turn in the social network. Needs more, like, please take a million and one roles. Um, <laughs> and then this was also, like, one of the fifth, this was the fifth highest rating DCOM when it came out. Um, and I get why. Yes. I really get why. Like, it's actually, like, if I'm going to do a redo of, like, what are my favorite DCOMs post being older and watching, like, the full suite, like, this is definitely going to be, like, top ten. Yeah. Probably. So, Probably. Yeah. It's really, really good. It's so good. Um, and then this was also, like, the highest rated DCOM in Japan and, like, broke records in U- in the UK and, in, like, Europe in general. I believe that. Um, so I just think, like, it... I think it's just one of those things that it just shows overall, like, not that diversity sells, but kind of that diversity sells. So, uh, yeah, and, and there's just... And that there's just a need and a desire for yeah. it. So if you supply it, you will be rewarded. You will be rewarded. Because I know a lot of people on the entertainment side of things only look at the dollars. <laughs> so if you just a look at the dollars... A lot of people only look at the dollars. <laughs> right, but I'm like, if you're the people just... actually trying to sell things, that's yeah. what you care about. Like, yeah. you don't care about, like, representing the little, like, e- e- you know, Chinese girl that's in L.A. So you you care about, like, okay, but are 7 million people about to tune in? <laughs> yeah, and they did. And they did. They really did. And, and you probably didn't know that they were going to. Because somehow the execs never do. They ne- Even like, after oh, they've wow, seen it happen before. <laughs> they're still confused. Everyone is just so confused. It's like, well, you know. There is an actual formula here. You just don't adhere to it. Yeah. Um, so I guess to tail it off, you know, do you think you'd show this one to the oh, kids? Oh, we're watching this. Come on, man. Mm-hmm. We're definitely watching this. This is also a great one that, like, if you, like, you know, like, I have I have little cousins who are very much in their gender roles. Um, and it's not, it hasn't been forced on them. They really came out the womb like that, and that's just how they are. Um, and, like, this is one that I feel like is particularly great because if you do... Like, if you do have a situation like that, it's one that, it, it, it straddles gender without necessarily forcing gender roles to break, if that makes sense. The idea that, like, you know, a, like, a young girl can watch this and doesn't have to decide that I want to do martial arts and she really loves fashion. Mm-hmm. And a young boy can watch this and doesn't have to decide that, like, he... You know what I mean? That he, like, I, I don't know exactly the way I'm saying it, but, like, he will enjoy the kung fu of it and not be like, oh, I don't want to watch girls. Right. That's how I, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it allows for those dualities to exist. Right. Even when the duality is hard. Um, so, yeah. I it, I enjoyed it for that reason. Because I know I see that with my godson right now. Like, he doesn't, like, he hates Frozen because he's, like, Girls. Yeah, girls. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, and his little sister loves it. So right. it's hard. Like, they have to fight over who gets to watch the TV. Right. You know? I feel like this is one where, like, I don't have to fight with my kids. Like, we'll all sit, and we'll all watch, and we'll all enjoy it for various reasons. And it's also, it's just baller. It's such a good, I really liked it. So, yeah, we're doing that. 
they don't have a choice. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I also would, like, love to watch this with, like, kids, because it's just so fun. And it's, like, just an action. It's just great, like, great action. And I do think, you know, at the end of... I mean, Brenda's song was... She just meant so much, I think, for our <laughs> generation especially. And, um, like, the fact that, like, I don't think she's the sole person who ushered in the idea of, like, <laughs> the, the, what ended up now becoming a stereotype of, like, crazy rich Asian. Um, but that's pretty much all she played. <laughs> like, when she was on Disney Channel, it was just, like, these, like, insanely, like, But, like, rich without, but, like, again, without the, like, Asian part. It's, like, she just was... She Asian. just, but she was just Asian. But it being wasn't rich. the character. Yeah, the character was like there was nothing. Um, because she just always sad. played these like I don't I even necessarily her. want to call them vapid because they were all like they have some smart. They they're smart. They're just not. Well, London wasn't necessarily. London had her moments. London would have her moments. London could understand empathy at a basic level at times. <laughs> so she reminded me more of like a niece type from Moesha. I don't, like, I don't. I don't know. This might. Th- well, uh, well, let's go ahead. Say it. Say no. Well, it, it, only in the fact that I'm like <laughs> you're giving off something. I do think it went deeper with London than Nisi because like Nisi was like actually smart. Um, and we end up finding out, but like you know where it's like this idea of like you're very much giving off like this like oh I'm like all I care about is fashion hair blah blah blah. blah. But then it's like if you go deeper. There's more to her than that. Well, you gave her a lot more credit than I did. I really was just like, she's the hotel heiress, and she doesn't have to worry about anything, so she doesn't worry about anything. No, she had her. She <laughs> had. She has some moments where she'll. Yeah, I'll, I'll you know. you. Yeah, but I'm not saying a lot. But I mean, it was the same with Nisi. Like we only found out Nisi was smart in the one episode, and it's never brought up again. Well, all right, fine, fair. Like Nisi ends up being a straight A student, and everybody's just like, "What?" <laughs> That's fair. Because you I, actively I, played dumb <laughs> for I, I four suppose. seasons. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> um, I won't belabor the point. I will say I like I love the idea of one day my kids like, or any kids, I, the idea of them being like, let's play, let's play Wendy Wu, let's play Homecoming Warrior. Like, right. I would love to hear that phrase because I think it's a phrase that I didn't get to do, but it would have happened. Oh yeah, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah, most definitely. Like, um. <laughs> I'm, I I don't know if you guys can tell, I'm having a bit of regret in not having watched this when I was younger and like having been able to like grow up with. Yeah, if it had come out, like, three or four years earlier, would have been great. Um, or would have, like, I think, impacted us a little bit differently. Though, I, you know, I still love it, like I said. Miss, yeah. Miss Brenda can act. So, <laughs> we always appreciate her from for that. Um, and then I guess I just want to end on, like, this point that I previously brought up to you. That, like, she did a Teen Vogue interview, like, a year or two ago. And basically said that she wasn't really considered to be in um, the film Crazy Rich Asians for whatever reasons, um, and, you know, she said that what she was told or what her management was told was that she wasn't quote-unquote Asian enough, um, and I just think it, like, I feel like that's one of those things that if you are a POC person, you've probably either heard or heard other people, like, that, that sentiment's been echoed at some point in your life, or you've heard it echoed to others, um, that you're not whatever enough because somebody has arbitrarily decided what that means. Um, and I just thought it was just something interesting to just, like, bring up because this movie, like we said at the beginning, kind of seems a little, (laughs) like, very, seems very, 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 like, you know, what you would think a Chinese kids (laughs) film in mainstream America would be. Like, Like, it very much is that. Like, yeah. But then it's just like... But then she's also playing a character that it's like, if you're going by these arbitrary arbitrary rules, her and her family wouldn't be considered quote-unquote Asian enough because they've not, you know, they've just become... They're just American at this point, you know? Yeah. And they say that. So I think it's just, like, an interesting thing just to bring up and also just to hammer in on the fact that people are not monoliths. Um, there's We've no said way it to, many times on the... But there's literally, literally no way to, to be any one thing. Exa- it's an important <laughs> word to remember. If you take nothing away from this podcast... Please take that away. Take away. Mo- most things that exist are not monoliths. Right. And it's just, like... It, it's just crazy because it's, like, she very much grew... Uh, we very much grew up with her being, like, 
<laughs> the Asian character. For real. And then, and so it's like for her now to not even be able to, you know, according, in, in her view, according to her, yeah. not even be able to like audition for what was literally like the biggest Asian American film since freaking the Joy Luck Club, which oh, I love. Um, you know, like it, it just seems a little crazy. Like, it's like when you just think about it, you're just like, but, but you invented, like, I, I didn't know that was a trope before you, <laughs> you, you played it. And I didn't even, and that was the other thing with her playing it is I never even connected that as a, like that never became a trope for me. It, the yeah, idea yeah, of a crazy never, rotation. It, it was just like, no, that's like. Brenda Song playing L- London Tipton or yeah, that's Brenda Song, song playing being Wendy Wu. Like, Brenda song. It's just Brenda <laughs> Song. It's the it, Brenda Song suite. It's, exactly. It's like, but I didn't even apply that to like, oh, that's like a whole Asian thing, you know? Like, yeah, that's that a whole never thing. Even that's happened. a whole part of, yeah. So it's just one of those, I just, you know, let, let's just keep that in mind, people. People mm-hmm. are not a monolith. They can be however they want to be. They can act however they want to act. And you got to treat them with respect. Yep. However they want to be, like, you got to, well, okay, oh, God, this always happens. Well, they're obviously, You're going to caveat it? I was... <laughs> Except the Nazis. Obviously, <laughs> except the Nazis. Okay? Uh, <laughs> except the Nazis. Anyone who isn't committing genocide or who doesn't aspire to be like someone who committed genocide, you must treat with respect. <laughs> no matter what they decide to do. Again, genocide is the big caveat to that. Um, <laughs> gen- gen- and torture, kind of, but torture can be subjective. Genocide is the big caveat oh, <laughs> to, no. that, to that particular <laughs> credence that I am going to. <laughs> publish into the world under my name but yes i think just in general people are not a monolith there's no one way to act like anything i don't care what type of you know ethnicity or race you are like it's like you can't there's no way to be black enough there's no way to be asian enough there's no way to be american latinx enough. a month you can't there's really there, no, there way, to really is no way to be american enough now please girl. please that's another one take that away too y'all please. know we're a hot mess and a gucci belt <laughs> That's the only way you can be American enough. Oh, Lord, yes. <laughs> so. Yes. Just a facade, honey. <laughs> just a facade. <laughs> and on that note, I think. We can wrap it up for this week. Thank you guys so much for listening. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of The Critics' Kingdom. Don't forget to follow us on Spotify and SoundCloud so you can stay up to date, as well as interacting and letting us know what you guys think on social media. You can find us on Twitter at Critics Kingdom and on Instagram at The Critics Kingdom. We're excited to talk to you again next week.